Ah, good evening, everyone. I just realized, or was just pointed out, uh, that my mic was muted. Good evening. Welcome to the historic Mount Wilson 60-inch telescope. Really pleased that you could join us this evening for a virtual star party. Um, my name is Dr. Jenny Krestov. I am one of the astronomers at Glendale Community College, and I am joined this evening with, by a number of astronomers and Mount Wilson personnel. Um, behind me is Dr. Christopher Burns from the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena. Um, and with me also is Mr. Tom Meneghini, Executive Director of Mount Wilson, uh, Mr. Richard Bell, who is one of the telescope operators here, Daryl Dooley, another session director. And session director, uh, Mr. Daryl Dooley, who's a telescope operator here, and um, Mr. Derek Pedigo, who I'm just this evening met. So we have a collection of astronomers here. Um, FYI, we have all been vaccinated. So if you see us without masks, we are educators, we are fully vaccinated. We are also technically outside. Um, we are in the dome, but it is open to the elements. So uh, we are, for the most part, still socially distancing because a year and a half or a year of habit is hard to break, apparently. Um, I'm really pleased you could join us this evening. I know this is not the face you'd want to see, though. I'm sure you want to see other more beautiful celestial objects. So we are going to head over to our first object this evening, which is the planet Mars. So let's see if I can get this going. We have Mars. So what you're seeing in your screen right now is the view through the 60-inch telescope with the help of the Attic Horizon 2 CMOS camera. So this is a special camera that is attached to the telescope in place of where the eyepiece usually is. And it is a digital camera. And the feed comes down a cable. This is not wireless. It comes down a cable to our computers. We've got six screens set up here. Five, actually. Um, and, oh, no, there's another one on the back side. Um, so we have six screens set up here. And right now, you are having a look at our view of Mars. Now, the wintertime is notorious for poor seeing, poor observing conditions here um, on Mount Wilson. This is the best view we have seen of Mars probably in months. I would say since we started doing this. Since we started doing this last, I think our inaugural uh, time was last November. So we have our lovely view of Mars. Now we're quite zoomed out. Yeah. Do you want to zoom in? in? And then maybe Chris will tell us what all the parameters are on the left hand side. These are all the um, parameters that can be changed when we're using the, teles the camera. Do they hear me all the way over there? I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe I can move <laughs> Let me see if I can move the mic all the way down to your end. There you go. That should work. Okay. So, uh, what you can probably see on the screen, does it show that it's the attic too? Probably not. Maybe not. Okay. All here on the left, we have these parameters that allow us to change how the camera is taking the data. Uh, this is a CMOS camera. And the biggest difference between a CMOS and a CCD, which is what you may more traditionally have seen on a telescope, is that it allows us to read out the data from the array much faster. And so you can almost treat a CMOS like a video camera. And right now, our exposure time, so each frame, is 0.05 seconds. And probably the frame rate that you're seeing, the update speed uh, that you're seeing now, is more a function of how fast the data can travel down the USB cable between the camera and the computer. Uh, by the way, the computer itself is a small uh, mini PC that's attached to the telescope itself. We'll show you that later on. Uh, the other options we have are binning, so that allows us to take each pixel 
and average it with its neighbor. And what that usually does is it reduces the amount of noise, uh, so it allows us to uh, get a, a better image for a given exposure time. And we also have below this the gain. So this is just like if you're working with a DLSR camera and you change the ISO number. We can do that with our CMOS. And so make it more sensitive or less sensitive. Uh, with more sensitivity, of course, we're gonna end up with more noise. So it's a, kind of a play back and forth between quality of the image and being able to get down to the depth that you want to get. Uh, we're cooling right now. Uh, this has a thermoelectric cooler on it. We're at minus 20 degrees. Maybe we'll just bump that up because it's relatively, oops, relatively cool up here. So let's try going down to maybe minus 25. We'll see if we can do that. Uh, and everything else is basically at the bottom where it shows us a nice histogram of where all the data is coming in. So this allows me to change what are called the levels. So throughout the night, you might see something like this happen when we first get to an object. It's blown out like this or this goes down to the bottom and you don't see anything and we just have to adjust this so that the blackest black and the whitest white are appropriate for what we're looking at. And since Mars is very bright, we're pushing it all the way up here. And in fact, we could even bring the exposure down a little bit and see how that looks. So let's bring it down to 0 0.01 seconds, but now I have to bring my levels down again. Okay, and you can probably tell it's dancing around, and there's a bit of fuzziness to it, and that's because we're looking through the atmosphere, and the Earth's atmosphere is like looking through a pool of water. Sometimes that atmosphere is nice and steady, and you get a nice crisp image, but sometimes, most of the time, it is turbulent, and it wanders around a little bit, and it makes the image not as crisp as it could be. And right now, we're sort of getting moments of clarity, but then it kind of gets fuzzy again. Uh, also, sometimes we have to play with the focus as the telescope moves across the sky and the mirror flexes in different ways. Sometimes we have to play with the focus to get it a little bit better. The black blacker? Okay, I can do that. Uh, oops, the other way. Ah! Hit the wrong button. Really actually doing anything? It doesn't seem to be doing very much. Okay, they're going to try and focus a little bit better. So uh, I can tell you, or Jenny, maybe you want to show in Stellarium what what we're actually looking at with Mars, because right in front, right now, on front of the Mars that we're looking at is Chaparelli Crater. Ooh, okay. So I will turn the mic around. I'm not sure if that makes much of a difference. Um, I am going to head over to a different part of our feed, our live stream feed, and this is to the program Stellarium. Now, if you are familiar with Stellarium, it is open source, free, downloadable software, and it is like a planetarium on your desktop. It's fantastic. So the view that I'm looking at right now is not right here on Earth. It's, oh, it's UTC. Is that right here? That's close. Um, yeah, I right. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, Mars, okay, so obviously you can see S right here. That stands for South. So we're gonna just uh, grab and drag, so to speak, with your mouse. You're be familiar with this. Over in the southwest, we have um, Sirius, we have Betelgeuse, um, and the stars of Orion, and Aldebaran, um, right over in the west. And above that, we have Mars. So if I click on Mars, it will center it, and then we can zoom in. And the neat thing about Stellarium is that as you zoom in, it changes from what is generally called a sprite to actual photographs. Um, if you zoom out a little bit, you can see Deimos and Phobos, but if we zoom in a little more, then we can see the side of Mars that we're actually looking at. Now, is this set for our I think so. date and time? Okay, 
So this is what we're looking at. I don't know that we can, um, we can click around and you can see different craters. This one there. That's Shepro. Oh. No, it see the problem <laughs> is that maybe if I zoom in more. So I think what we want is this one. Oh, I love, or maybe that one. That's Cassini. Um, I love how it's mimicking the uh, um, atmospheric, scene. <laughs> atmospheric scene here because we've got the artificial atmosphere on. Um, there are a lot of small features here that have been named and you can see Pasteur and Henry. <laughs> love it. <laughs> um, Cassini, of course, was the uh, Italian astronomer who first noticed with his telescope that there was a gap in the um, rings of Saturn. But, oh, whoa, nuts. Zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. Oh, I, oh, there's Mars. Pause time and zoom in. So this is what we are seeing. Now you will notice on our Stellarium feed here, the part of Mars that is kind of in shadow is going to be this upper left part which I suppose if you zoom out sufficiently is going to be the eastern side of, whoops, the kind of up to the more eastward side. But if we now go back and head to the attic view, you can see that the side of Mars that we actually see through the telescope that is a little more shaded is the right hand side toward the bottom. That's because telescopes not only invert the image but they also flip it left to right, which is a fun cool thing about optics. And if you've ever taken an astronomy or physics class, you may have encountered that for yourself. But this is the live view that we have through the 60-inch telescope. Now, you guys said you were going to be focusing it. Are you still working on that? I think they've gotten as good as they can get. We're sort of fighting against the atmospheric seeing at this point. Yep. But every now and then, if you just stare at it, yeah, you get a nice frame, and you can see dark features on the surface, and you're, and you're looking at that, that dark feature that we saw in Stellarium pretty clearly. Yeah. But this is why we like space telescopes. Yes. <laughs> One of the huge advantages of being above the atmosphere is you don't have to look through the atmosphere, unless, of course, you're looking back down at the Earth. Have you been checking on your questions? I have been checking. Okay. Um, I, I told everyone out there in YouTube land that they could ask questions or post comments, and Kate said that this is wonderful. Thank you for hosting. And Michael Rudy said hello to the MWO GCC Carnegie peeps. Hello. Hey, Michael. <laughs> Hey, it's after Easter. I'm not a peep. <laughs> <laughs> but this is Mars. A live view of Mars. Yeah. If any of you, I guess Michael was here last week. He might have seen... Did we even, maybe we didn't even bother last week. No, we went, with, we went with the moon. And then when we saw how the moon was, we just said, no, no point in doing Mars. <laughs> uh, so the phase of the moon this week is uh, just past third quarter. I think it's only 24% illuminated. So we're heading to new moon. So we will not be able to view the moon tonight because moonrise isn't until something like 3.30 tomorrow morning. We are not going to be here that late. But the advantage of observing when you do not have a moon is that you don't have that gigantic, bright, glowing object kind of uh, washing out all of the fainter dark sky objects that you might want to be, a, you know, try and catch a glimpse of. Um, that is what we are going to do tonight. There's a list of objects that we have. We'll probably look for some double stars and some planetary nebula. Um, I think there may be a uh, galaxy we may try and look for. So we have an interesting collection of objects that we're going to look at tonight. Now the lights have come back on. We're back. So are we going to move to a different target? We're going to try M42. Ooh. And so you can turn it to the dome view whenever you want. Okay. Um, 
we have a, a telescope operator in training. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so they're heading over to M42 now? I think they're going to go there. Okay. We're going to try so it. I'm going to go to the dome view here. I'm over on the left-hand side. And in front of you, you can see the gigantic telescope that is the 60-inch telescope here at Mount Wilson. So this is a telescope that had first light, and I want to say 1908, is that right, or 1904? 1908 is first light here, and 1917 is the 100-inch. 19, I got it right the first time. 1908 was first light for this telescope, so it has been operational for more than 100 years. Um, yes, I, I, just, I just paused. And it's as working just as good as it was at the beginning. So. Better. Tom just moved the, well, better now because we have some more modern components. Tom just moved the ladder, and I'm not sure if you can see the marks on the floor. So the ladder is in its parking position, and there are marks taped to the floor for where the ladder has to be so when the telescope is moved that it never actually knocks into the ladder because that would be bad. If you hear some creaking in the background, this is the dome that is rotating, which you can probably see. Using the same components, the same wheels, everything that was installed over 100 years ago. And we have to rotate the dome because we're going to be looking at a different part of the sky. And you'll notice the telescope only has a strip of the dome to look through. And I don't know, it's up there. I don't know if you can see it, it's a darker, it's, it's where there's no dome, but it's very dark up there, so you can't see it very well. But the telescope will move in a mirror and you can see where the telescope will be pointing. You're not gonna see anything interesting if the telescope is pointing to the inside of the dome. It will look rust colored. The dome isn't actually rusty, it's just painted this color, kind of a rust color. Um, and there goes the telescope. The telescope actually, the telescope when it moves is very quiet. It has to move in two different directions, um, east-west and then kind of north-south. So it is on a big, I don't know if you can see the round thing. Let me see if I can point with my finger. Woo. Nope, this round thing there at the back, the light gray, that is kind of what, I don't know if you'd call it a wedge on a giant telescope like this, but the whole telescope is tipped to have it so that the one motion of the telescope is parallel to the celestial equator, to the equator of the Earth, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. Hopefully I haven't just complicated that for you. But, oh, let me see if I can do this. This is our laser pointer. So I don't want to flash anyone in the eyes, but this. <laughs> it was working. Is not working. <laughs> our laser pointer. It's cool. Oh, green, green lasers don't like the cold. It's not that cold in here. It's actually 56, which is warm for last night. Fairly warm. <laughs> I am wearing a very warm jacket. I have learned this from experience um, to dress very warmly, and then you can always undo your jacket. But if you don't dress warmly enough, I get to the point where I get so cold I can't think properly. <laughs> Didn't know that was a thing. Now, one thing about the, moving this telescope in the way we are, uh, we are going to a low altitude, so distance from the horizon. And you may see that this platform that juts out from the base of the dome, the shutter, uh, has kind of this gap in it, so the telescope can point down it, nice and low. I hit auto uh, we call this, we call this the parachute. Um, or no, the cradle, we call it the cradle. And uh, so you have to be really careful when you're moving the telescope into this position, uh, because if you go too far, 
then of course you can crash the telescope into part of the platform. That platform is actually called the Newtonian platform, and it is on rails. Now, let's see. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of green laser. Let's see. It shows up in that video feed. Uh, come on. Nope. Nope. Well, it's Are your hands warm enough? Maybe your hands. My hands warm. might be a little warmer. So those, uh, so the, the platform rides on rails that go up either side of the shutter. And if the instrument that you were using was mounted at the top of the telescope, and if the telescope is pointing almost straight up, then you need to get up there, or the astronomer would need to be able to get up there. And so they would stand on the platform, and the platform would ride the rails up towards the top, okay. and you could then reach the uh, prime focus, is what we call it, right at the top. And I think we're probably getting close, so I'm going to start seeing what is in view, so I think we should probably turn the lights out. Yes, yeah, so for those of you, so we are heading toward our target right now is M42. If you are unfamiliar with the Messier catalog, M42 is the Great Orion Nebula. So now I look spooky because it's dark in the dome again. And we are going to do just looking over at the image that Chris is trapezium finding are you ready for us to uh, pop let's, that over let's just wait until they have centered <laughs> everything they're still centering the telescope so things are still moving around um but i can give you a little history what was that tom i think they're just talking so i give you a little history read a little history um about the great Orion Nebula, and I'm reading from the information provided by the software, uh, the app, the mobile app called Sky Safari Pro. So, discovery in history, it says about the Great Orion Nebula. The Mayans of Central America had a folk tale that suggests that they knew of the Orion Nebula. But despite being visible to the naked eye, the nebula is not mentioned in any known historical records before the invention of the telescope. Neither Ptolemy nor Al-Sufi noted the nebula, even though they both listed patches of nebulosity elsewhere in the night sky. Around 130 AD, um, Ptolemy cataloged the brightest stars within the nebula as one bright star, as did Tycho Brahe in the late 16th century and Johann Bayer in 1603, who designated them as Theta Orionis. In 1610, Galileo detected a number of faint stars when he first looked at this region with his telescope, but he curiously failed to note the nebula as well. Later, in 1617, Galileo took a closer look at the star, the star, uh, Theta Orionis, and found it to be a triple star. But again, he, fa he failed to perceive the nebula, or if he did, he failed to write about it. This has led to a speculation that its illuminating stars had flared up since that time, increasing the nebula's brightness. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the term nebula, it is um, the term that astronomers use to define a huge cloud of gas and dust in outer space. Many nebula uh, do not emit visible light, but emission nebula do. And what we're looking at is an emission nebula. The gases of this cloud uh, receive ultraviolet light from very bright nearby stars. They absorb that light and then they re-emit that energy in the visible wavelengths of light. So this is a nebula. I love the nebulosity that they're talking about. This is a nebula that um, has historically not been perceived. Chris is giving me the thumbs up. Let's head right over there. All right, so we have four stars. Oh, we have more than four stars. Well, we are seeing at the moment <laughs> four stars. These are the four bright stars at the center of the Orion Nebula. And 
<clears throat> Together they, is, they are known as the trapezium. So what are you going to do for us now, Chris? We're now going to increase the exposure. Right now we're at half a second uh, per frame. And this is so that you can see the stars. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit because there's an interesting thing going on that we're going to lose when I increase the exposure and we start looking at the nebula itself. Uh, it looks like every one of these little stars is almost like it's gone through a prism. They look like little rainbows. So you have blue at one end and red at the other end, and it's the same for all these different stars. And this is due to the what we call atmospheric refraction. So before we were talking about looking through the atmosphere, it's like looking through water, uh, but water also refracts. And so right now it's acting like a giant prism. And because we're so close to the horizon, we're so low down, this effect gets stronger and stronger as we get closer and closer to the horizon. We look through more and more atmosphere. Yeah, so there you go. Stars, just like the sun, make rainbows because they're all stars. Now we're gonna zoom out and we're going to increase the exposure and see what happens. Let's go to three seconds. Stretch. Stars. Ooh. <laughs> That's pretty. <laughs> All right. So again, for those of you who have joined us before on previous sessions, this is looking a lot better than it has in the past. And so the other thing we can do, because we have quite a few stars in this field now, uh, we're going to try doing something called live stacking. So I'm going to stop this part here. We got to go to this other view. Uh, which all my settings are now different, but I can. <coughs> no, I want to go this way. And I want to bring this out. Okay, we're going to do three second exposures. Uh, let's do medium and let's take a second. Let's take a couple of frames to make sure this is working. Okay, looks good. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on live stacking, which is there. Now, the reason we do this live stacking uh, is because even though the telescope is pointed at the pole, and it's an equatorial telescope, so it should follow the stars very nicely, or I should say uh, it undoes the rotation of the Earth so that the stars stay in the same spot. Uh, it's not perfect, and so if we make the uh, exposure times go too long, we will get star trails. So the stars will start not being round anymore, they'll start making little trails. And also, if we make the exposure too high, uh, thanks to Los Angeles, we have high, quite a high background light. And so that will also build up and build up and build up. So by taking short exposures and then adding them together and taking an average, the stuff that's real, like stars, Oh, it's not stacking, is it? I'm not stacking. Yes, yeah, it's going. Uh, the things that are actual stars, real stars and real gas and all that sort of stuff, that will start to show up more and more and more, and the background noisy uh, sky will get less and less and less and smoother and smoother, and we'll just see more stuff come out. Uh, it also means with shorter exposures, we won't uh, overexpose the, uh, the bright ones at the center you know, by too much and then lose everything. So we can just sit here and watch it increase. We're right up now. We've got 17 uh, frames that have been stacked. The software also looks for cases where you might have moments of better seeing than other moments. And if it gets bad, it will reject it. So we have a running count of 21 that have been kept and eight that have been rejected uh, based on the quality of the image. All right, let's see if I can also play around with the levels a bit. more of the stuff. There we go. Okay. So if anyone's got questions, feel free to ask. We have Beckstrom Observatory. Ooh, where's Beckstrom that? Observatory. That is in Michigan. Oh. They are joining us this evening. So welcome everyone from Michigan. I'm not sure what your, other, your weather is like up there these days. 
Um, it's pretty, pretty sunny usually here in, in Southern California. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about what we're seeing uh, in this. So as Jenny mentioned before, nebula, nebula is just a general term for faint fuzzy things. But in this case, what we're looking at is mostly hydrogen gas that is being lit up by these stars. And these are brand new stars. These have just formed out of this cloud of gas. And in some ways, the, the cloud of gas acts kind of like a cocoon. So they're all sort of enshrouded in this gas. And they can actually be quite dim, and it's very hard to see them. So there are some Hubble Space Telescope's uh, images out there called the Pillars of Creation, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. And th those are, again, these sort of dark, dense clouds that kind of hide these first stars. But what's happened here is that the radiation pressure from these stars has blown open a hole into this cavity that we are now looking into. So if we were actually looking at the Orion Nebula from some other place in our galaxy, we might not see this really beautiful, lit up uh, interior. We might just see a dark nebula. Uh, Which is possibly what possible reason why Ptolemy and Galileo and um, Tycho couldn't see it as well, because they never noted it. They never did? Oh, no. interesting. So these are brand new, uh, so I forget exactly how old they are, but we're talking about tens of millions of years, not billions of years like our sun is. Our sun is actually kind of middle-aged. Um, the red color that you're seeing in this image is real. That's coming off of our CMOS chip, which has red, green, blue filters built onto it. And it can use that information to make a color image in real time. And the red you see is hydrogen. And specifically, it's the hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. And that electron can bounce around between different levels, uh, kind of like orbits, but they're okay, at very fixed energies. Gonna rotate when, a little bit. Gonna rotate? Gonna rotate a little bit. All right. We might get a little background noise because the dome is going to rotate a bit because as we track the sky, the telescope moves automatically, but the dome does not. We have to move that one by hand. There it is. So there is some chatter in the uh, um, feed. Okay. So there is, um, I tell Ketna Leatherworks uh, is uh, an amateur astrophotographer. Aside from the massive telescope, we do almost the same thing. But they say our gear is way better. Well, so. yes and no. <laughs> We're about to show you uh, another view through another telescope that actually uh, may put this to shame. <laughs> um, by the way, it's seven degrees in Michigan today. Seven? Seven T. Oh, seven T. Oh, wow. Which is awesome. Ball me. Uh, the uh, Taketna. Leatherworks is in Alaska. It was minus eight. Wow. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Oh, yes. goodness. <laughs> so, Ugh. and also there's Mike Drummer who says it's neat to see the E and F stars next to the trapezium. I guess these would be the ones. Oh, the. Two. Uh, sorry, the, yeah, the ones down at the bottom. Yeah, a lot of the time we don't. So a lot of the times when we were imaging this in our previous sessions, we couldn't see them at all. They were completely blended with the trapezium. They, the seeing was so bad. It's really nice to be able to see all the different components. Which ones are E and F? Um, is it this one or this, this one? one? This yeah, one? this one or this one. The, that's the there's, there's one here and one there. Okay. And there's one there and one there. Northeast, that's southwest. That's just from memory. Northeast and southwest. I have no idea what direction there's which in this. That's unfortunate. what you're saying. <laughs> so it's that this one, one. Right there on the end. Yeah. And this one down here. And this one down here. Okay. That's, that's E and F, right? That's and there's G and H. G and H yeah. Yeah. underneath here and here. All right, so currently we are at uh, 300, no, 103 exposures that have been stacked together to make this composite image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the stacking off, and we're going to go back to a single image just so you can see what the, oh, actually, no, let's, let's take a picture. Let's, save, let's that. save this first. All right, so um, there's another question. Um, Mark is asking that why, when you look through a smaller amateur telescope like Aiden Schmidt, you don't see the red color. And... I would say that's because you're not getting enough light. I would say, yeah, hydrogen is almost always the, 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 the less bright. Yes, yes, we're getting there in no, the no, universe. No, 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 this is five inch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's when I think, I think Mark um, was that? saying when you look at the Orion Nebula. Visually. Oh, visually, right, okay. 
a um, eight inch telescope, you don't see red because you're just looking with your eyes. Yeah, yeah you, your visually. optic nerve refreshes the signal it sends to your brain at least three times a second. So it's like your exposure time is a third of a second. And to see color, you need enough light coming in to um, activate your cones in your eye. If it's a low light situation, then only your rods will be seen. So for smaller telescopes that don't gather as much light, then you are likely just seeing that with your rods, which literally are just intensity levels and you cannot see light and dark. Um, All right, I'm gonna turn the stacking off. So Chris is turning the stacking off. So we'll go back to just, and you can see how noisy it got. Kalamazoo, Michigan. We have a few people from Michigan joining us this evening. Yeah. And there it is. That's what it looks like when you only take a three second exposure. Okay, now, before we lose the object, we're going to bring over another oh, view. Yes. Taken, by the way, Mark, with a five inch telescope. But this is what you can do if you have software that stacks and then collects the light and stacks that light. It's kind of like, I guess, well, it's just stacking. Let's see if I can make it bigger. I don't know other way. Addition. addition. Yeah, it's yeah. addition. You just take the light and you keep adding and adding and adding and adding, and, but you stack it one on top of the other so that your image looks very bright. And this is, well, I'm going to let Richard explain what telescope is used for this particular image. Yeah, this is a 130 millimeter TMB refractor. And the chip on there that we're using is a ASI 2400. And so it's a little bigger chip, but um, just because the optics are different, you get a much wider field of view. So like she said, uh, you need a camera to start picking up color on a lot of objects that aren't bright enough for your eye to pick them up. But once you got a camera on there, you can really do some stuff. Yeah. And once again, this is also a CMOS camera, so, and it has what's called a Bayer filter on it, so it's got the built-in red, green, blue pixels, so you don't have to do the thing we used to do with uh, changing to a red filter, take an exposure, take a green filter, take an exposure, take a blue filter, and then add them up in Photoshop afterwards. This does it for you in real time, which actually makes it really quite fun to just do it. This is actually live right now. This is not just a, a picture we pulled off the, off the web. It's but it's stacking live. It's yeah, stacking it's, live. It's, not, ten it's not just the exposures. live view. Yeah, so we are, it's taking 10 second exposures and where does it say how many we've got? Yeah, we've got 93. So again, this is about as many stacks as we had with the, the 100 inch. The only difference is that with, the, sorry, not the 100 inch, 60 inch, my mistake. But if we zoom into that same region, let's see if I can do that. A little bit farther. There they are. So you can see, here's the trapezium that we were looking at with the other view. And one thing you'll probably notice is that there, you, get, you almost get too much of the nebula to see the individual stars. Whereas if we go back to the view through, oh, we lost the stack, <laughs> oops, oh well. Uh, here, you probably will notice, we see more of the stars behind the nebulosity. And this is just the way the optics work when you have uh, a different focal ratio with these different yeah. telescopes. So the, the 60 inch is an F16, and yours is a F7. F7. So that gives you different sensitivities to stars versus uh, background. Plus, nebulas. since the 60 can collect so much more light, we can see the E and F star in the trapezium, whereas in the um, refractor, we really don't see them. Yeah. Let's see if we zoom in. Not really. Yeah, not really. <laughs> Any other questions? No, but our, our, our fellow astronomer in Alaska has a Bortle scale rating of one to two well. in their area. I'm so jealous. <laughs> yes. That's so dark. Hey, hey we did two back in 1920. Yeah. <laughs> 1908. <laughs> in fact, um, actually, as early as 1925, uh, the folks here at Mount Wilson realized that their days were numbered when Pasadena started introducing gaslight. And that's when they decided that the next telescope beyond the 100 inch was going to have to go somewhere else. So instead of being at Mount Wilson, the Palomar Observatory ended up at Mount Palomar, uh, which was a darker, sky, darker site. Yep. 
which is, I guess, more towards San Diego than Mount Wilson is. Um, just east of Legoland, as I would tell my <laughs> students at college, because many of them have been to Legoland, and that's a good landmark. Um, but our lovely Alaska astronomer, and maybe, Richard, this will make more sense to you, the telescope I use is a Wilkin Optics Z61 with a 360-millimeter focal length. Yes. Uh, a Canon 60 MK2 and ZWO ASI 183 MC Pro Astrocam. Yes. With an um, HEQ5 Pro mount. So he's using a, a slightly smaller refractor than what we were using. He actually has a wider field of view. Mm. And he's got his beautiful dark skies. But we have really good seeing. I do. I'm gonna, we got something here. <laughs> <laughs> we can I we can, we can be down to a, under a half an arc second. Yeah. On a good you, night. I remember though. I think we're there um, tonight. A colleague and I were trying to arrange what Glendale Community College, in its infinite wisdom, called a study abroad to Alaska. <laughs> Which always, mm, yeah, because Alaska is abroad. But we, I was talking to a colleague up at the University of Alaska in Anchorage about coming and doing astronomy, and he just started laughing because the number of clear nights was not great. Mm. Yes. Um, California is known for its clear nights. So, so we're going to head out, head on. We're going to turn the lights off just so people can see, sorry, light, turn the lights on so people can see how low the telescope is. Ah, OK, so we go back to our dome view. Inside our 60-inch dome. So we're running out of time on this telescope, on this object. So we're going to move somewhere else. Uh, I will tell you where in a second after I confer with my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> and I think so I have the laser um, pointer working now. Oh no. It oh, uh, sometimes they take out the. So <laughs> this is I don't know. If, oh, you can see the green dot. I'm going to put it just on the bo toward the bottom of the telescope, and I'm making a circle with it. I'm going to put it right up to the dome. So you can see there's a dot going up and down one of the struts of the dome. So I'll be able to point out things like the fact that there is a giant, I'm going to kind of trace out where the, the dome opening is That's what the dome here. Line. It's not bad. I was going to say, like, when I hit the auto stretch, I want to hold And there we go. <laughs> so this is our live view of the fabulous. All of this showed up. Um, 60 inch telescope here. Um, many of the telescopes, if you've seen amateur telescopes, they yes. are a solid tube, and that is to keep light from kind of getting inside them. Um, you'll notice our telescope has just a framework because typically it's really dark in the dome and we don't need to cover it up. And the telescope weighs enough as it is, we want to keep it as light as possible. And there it goes. So we're going to the Clown Face next. The Clown Face Nebula next. Also known as NGC, uh, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> NGC 2392. It is also a nebula. It is not a star formation region, though. So there are different types of giant clouds of gas and dust out there in space. This is a much smaller nebula, and it's called a planetary nebula, which has absolutely nothing to do with planets. Um, it, this type of nebula was first uh, begun to be seen in the late 17, early 1800s, and this was right after Uranus was discovered. Uranus looks kind of fuzzy through the telescopes that were available back in the day, the 1780s. And it had kind of this um, aqua colored green bluish color. And when astronomers started seeing other fuzzy green bluish things out there in space, they thought, oh, we found more planets. Because prior to the discovery of Uranus, you know, the planets were the planets. It was the six planets that orbited the sun, and that was pretty much it. And then Uranus was discovered and like, mind-blowing, there's more out there. So they would see these other fuzzy objects and they thought, well, is that a planet? And they realized it wasn't because planets will move with respect to very distant stars because planets orbit the sun. 
and so their position will change. Um, these fuzzy objects did not move with respect to the background stars, so they, they, they realized that what they were looking at was not a planet, but it kind of looked like a planet, so they called them planetary nebula, and for whatever reason, the name has stuck. There are a number of kind of terms and names wow. in the, wow, wow, that looks good, in um, astronomy that are really poor choices in retrospect, and planetary nebula, nebulae are one of those um, terms. But we're, you know, we haven't changed it yet, for whatever reason. So there we go. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, and I apologize. Talk, Takitna Leatherworks. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that crazy, that correctly. Um, you were not the only person worried about the bobcat fire <laughs> at Mount Wilson Observatory last year. While they're fussing around trying to find it, let me show you some uh, images that were taken. So let me go over to slides here. And this is uh, just some Google Docs slides that I put together. Um, this evening is brought to you by the observatories of the Carnegie Institute of Washington, Glendale Community College, and Mount Wilson. Um, the Glendale Community College, for those of you who don't know, is the closest community college to Mount Wilson. It is a 41 minute drive for me to go from work up to here, not that I've been on campus much recently, but um, Mount Wilson is spectacular. Mount Wilson does have a tower cam on yeah, its it seems like um, this be cool. 150 foot solar tower, and this is a screenshot that I took on, I think the date is up there. Is there I can't that? see it. It's September 17th. Yep. I took this picture as a screenshot from the tower cam on the night that I was teaching an astronomy lab. And I had told my students that there were two major events that had gone down in astronomy that week. And I can't remember the first one, but the second one was this. And in real time, I was watching this fire get bigger. Now, what I didn't know, I don't think any of us knew at the time, was this is a backfire that the f local firefighters had lit to protect the observatory. But I, I was speechless in lab, and I'm still getting a little choked up. I was speech speechless in lab, and I, I basically said to my students, I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I, I just can't concentrate, because it would refresh every 10 seconds or so, and I just watching the flames go over. Um, for the extent of the bobcat fire, it's huge. But I'm being told that I gotta get back to the view through the dome. So I am gonna go straight back to the attic view. There we go. And this is NGC 2392. Just Known as behind. the Clown Face Nebula. It's clearly a Cyclops clown. Because <laughs> yeah. there's so many of them out there. Clowns are always scary. Let's not be beat around the bush here. <laughs> okay, so we're going to steadily increase the exposure time uh, to bring out more of what's going on. So th might... what you're looking at at the very center is the remains of a star. It is the compressed central regions of a medium mass star that, had, that has exhausted its nuclear fuel. And it's the nuclear fusion that creates energy and light and kind of holds the star up by the, the, the radiation, um, pushing outwards against gravity. But when there's no energy put, trying to escape from the core of the star, the star collapses in on itself. And so this is a white dwarf at the center, and it's surrounded by the outer atmospheres of the star that have puffed off into space. Kind of a last gasp, if you would. And Chris is increasing the time. The exposure time. Exposure time, yeah. Uh, and so you're seeing, ooh, yeah. there you go. 
Is she stacking yet? No. Not yet. We're, we'll tr we'll, we will try stacking, but I, I suspect we haven't got enough stars for, for it to figure out how to stack them. But, oh, let's just, let's try. <laughs> let's see what happens. If nothing else, you get to see what bad stacking looks like. All right, or so just one. one. So for your, your audience, to stack we need enough stars so that they can align the photographs. And since the 60 inch telescope actually sees so close in, it actually cuts its own field of view so it doesn't get enough stars. Alright, let's try going up to 15 seconds. So as, as we increase the exposure time, you're probably going to notice that the background gets kind of grayer and grayer and darker and, dar uh, and brighter and brighter. But we're starting to see the, the second outer ring, and then there's an inner ring. Let me bring this up a bit. Yep. So this isn't just a ring. This is actually kind of a sphere that's expanding out into space. And given enough time, a few tens of thousands of years, this will dissipate and no longer be visible. So just like with the Great Orion Nebula, the gases receive the ultraviolet light from nearby stars, and they absorb that energy and then re-emit that energy in visible wavelengths. Right now, the gases surrounding this white dwarf, white dwarfs are very hot, and they emit preferentially in the ultraviolet wavelength range. The white dwarf is emitting all this UV light. It's some visible light as well, obviously, because we can see it. But that UV is being absorbed by the gases and then being, um, that energy that has been absorbed is being emitted in the visible light. And what we see is kind of the edge of the bubble. So if you imagine, you know, kind of a bubble in front of you, or you hold your hands up like there's a bubble in front of you and you're hanging on to the bubble, your hands, you've got your fingers and they're almost like front and back to you. Depends on if, well, depends on how you're holding the bubble. But there's a lot of material that we kind of see along the line of sight and it's a much thinner amount of material that we would see kind of front and back of the white dwarf. I don't know if that makes sense at all but there's more material on the sides where as we were looking you see more of the um, expelled gases or the former gases um, but this is this is right. what we see of that sphere i'm going to bring in richard's uh image which is is able to stack because it's got enough its field is large enough that it has enough stars. Richard's can... telescope has a bigger field of view, and it has the stars that the software can latch onto in order to stack. And this is where you really see this lovely, brilliant blue-green color. And you can see why early astronomers who didn't have the resolution that we have here um, would have mistaken this for something like Uranus. It's the same tinge of green-blue. This is stunning. Right, and if we zoom in far, this is the kind of night where you can really start to see the difference between the smaller aperture telescope's resolution yep. and the 60 inches. So if we look at that, and sort of keep that in mind, and then we'll bring back the other one, you can kind of see that there's, you get to see more details in here, though, with a single 20 second exposure, we don't get down deep enough to see all the vibrant colors that you can get when you actually can do a proper stack. So there are advantages to each. Uh, 30 seconds. Oh, 30 wait. seconds, oh my gosh. 30 seconds, oh, actually I might try binning just to see what happens. Yes. So let's try Mike, we seconds. are aware it is called the Eskimo, or it used to be called the Eskimo Nebula. Um, that term for many people living in the Arctic is not a term they use anymore, so I don't know if it would be more appropriate to call it an Inuit nebula. Um, I understand that some of the Native Americans in Alaska okay. still 
use the term Eskimo, but that is a term that is not universally liked. So we tend to call it either NGC 2392 or one of its other names, which is the Clown Face Nebula. But again, I don't know about the clown. The whole idea of calling it the es Eskimo Nebula was because the ring looked like, I guess the central region would be like the face, and then the, the ring around it would be like the sunburst that many of the Arctic people um, sew onto their parka. parka. So this is layers of different furs that they make. It's beautiful, and it's, yeah, what they have around the hood of their parka to keep them warm. And at, you know, minus eight in April, warmth is really important. <laughs> We just saw, that's how bad stacking works. Yeah, so you can see the doubling up, or you could so see. It thought it knew how to, how to stick it in, but it, uh, it got it Didn't wrong. do it so well. You got two that were Yeah. The other thing you might copied. start seeing, I think, is on the edges of the screen. You can see there's a little brighter. I suspect that's where we're starting to see thermal radiation from the, or thermal noise from the, uh, the readouts. Mm. The from the camera itself. In the camera itself. Are we cooling? Oh, I think that one actually stacked. Mm. Yeah, you can see a little bit of color. Up at the top, it looks a little more, I won't more say red. it's red, but a little more red-ish. Yeah, and the eagle-eyed observer may notice that the stars are not quite round anymore. They got a little bit of an elongation in one direction. So this is what happens when we, you know, they oh. did there too. <laughs> is that? They're getting that on the refractory. Oh, refractory. no, it just did the stacking, and it didn't do it well. So you can see oh, that kind of split personality when you try and stack. That star, bottom left, you can see the double up. Although you're starting to see some really beautiful structures in that. Um, yeah, that's because I think you got the two. Oh, that might be. <laughs> Let's see what it does in the next one. It's probably going to really get confused now. Poor software. I know, it's, it, it does what it can. Uh, all right, I'm going to reset it. Let's try it again. So now we're just going to start from scratch, get rid of all the, the stacks, and try and do it again. Oh, and the other thing, I'll bring back the, uh, the refractory image while it's doing that. Oops, shoot, what did I just do? Double click it, make it bigger. <laughs> so I am just going to Stellarium again, um, and I am actually going to do that just quickly so that you can see what we're looking at. Um, this kind of pulsating blue square is the actual um, NGC 2392, Eskimo Nebula, Clown oh, Place Nebula. It's pretty faint. It has a magnitude of 9.61. If you know the magnitude scale, anything down to sixth magnitude is what you can see with your eyes from Earth. If it's as faint as six, it goes basically from, well, zero to six. That's what you can see with the eyes. If we zoom in here in the constellation of Gemini, you can see this. So this is an image here. It's not great resolution, but this is probably an image taken with possibly the um, Hubble Space Telescope. I'm not sure what uh, telescope would have been taken with this or would have taken this image. But let's head, are you guys ready for me to come well, actually, back? Actually, go, go back to it. We managed to get one stack. So okay. we're now up to a Woo. full minute. A full minute, look at that. And you can start to see some really nice, I think they're real structures in there. Let's see what it does now. Oh, it didn't stack it. Oh, I'm still, still at a minute. But I think this is, this is so much better than we had for almost all of January, February, and March. Yeah, tonight's observing is pretty stellar. Ha ha. It's, <laughs> but um. The clouds are the only issue. Have we got a lot of clouds? Um, Potentially. I'm seeing the glow of LA. Oh. 
You always see the glow of LA here. Okay. So it's near the horizon, they're having issues. Okay. Ah, uh, so I'm going yeah, to definitely see some color at the not top stacked, not side stacked. of I'm that. Just try one more time, and then I'm going to have to Sometimes, if it gets one stack on there, the stars become bright enough that it now can stack. Yeah, yeah. Shop, shop talk. How to stack images. Yeah, and how to cheat oh, the system. Three. We got three. And three good. stacks. Oh, that is looking good. Let's but you're right, the bottom looks like there's a bit of thermal noise. You got it. I mean, go with it. Might as well. So, if you're wondering what the different colors are caused by, it's actually different types of atoms that make up this nebula. So a nebula, of course, is a cloud of gas and dust. Um, the gases are usually atomic. Occasionally, there's molecules like carbon monoxide and things like that. But the different colors here are caused by different types of atoms glowing. So the red, which you saw in the Orion Nebula, and you can see kind of on the top edge here, that is going to be the hydrogen gases that are glowing. Any peachy colored or kind of creamy colored, that's typically helium. And then the green is going to be oxygen, doubly ionized okay. oxygen, which means it's it. had an electron stripped it. off. But, but I'm um, not we have two electrons, sorry. We have uh, different types of atoms that can glow different colors. And you may be wondering, well, how do you know? We've actually isolated these oh. atoms in glass tubes on the Earth, and we've energized them, basically plug them in. This is the science of spectroscopy. We can do this with atoms, different elements. We can do it with molecules. You can do it in the visible light spectrum, as well as the infrared and the ultraviolet spectrum here on Earth, because we have equipment that can detect these different wavelengths. So this is looking pretty good. And we are looking again. Richard has finally got some stacking happening with We were stacking before. Yeah. Now we did some resetting just to, since the 60s now, did it stack that last one? It's, it's actually. We did, got it. Sometimes if the 60, on the 60, if we can get the stars to pop a little bit more, the next stack actually can stack. And so it's actually, starting to get better and better. It's hard to beat a lot of glass. <laughs> yeah, 60 inch diameter mirror in our telescope. That's serious surface area you're talking. That's looking pretty good. You can see exactly where the, <laughs> the thermal noise on I just that. remember coming up here the first time and just look, staring at the telescope going, it's huge. <laughs> it's still huge to me, but oh, it's... It's lovely coming up here. For a 45 minute drive, it's lovely to escape the city, get to the mountains. Which is why we have so many people here tonight. Well, so many, seven, six. It's just. I didn't like it. Sorry, everyone sees the. Uh, no, it's interesting to see <laughs> this type of thing. Uh, okay. How to save images. So this is NGC. What was it again? Two three nine two. Twenty three ninety two. Yep. Okay. Save. NGC. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the new general catalog, was the new general catalog, uh, new back in eighteen eighty, <laughs> or the eighteen eighties. So we still call it the new general catalog. I think I've mentioned that there are some terms in astronomy that should probably be updated. Um, yeah, 140 years old, new, awesome. All right, we're gonna move to another object now, I think. Okay, where are we you know, going to go? It's really interesting. This, this Does looks anyone amazing. have any desire to see anything in particular? I can't promise we can get there because there are limitations to what our telescope, uh, how far it can get to the horizon. Um, but if you are dying to see anything in particular, 
put it in the feed, and if we can't get to it tonight, we may be able to get to it over the next few observing sessions. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with our virtual star parties, um, we do this every two weeks. At the moment, it is through to the end of May. So this is funded by Glendale Community College, and the end of our semester ends at the end of May. So we'll have to see if there is um, funding, additional funding that we can use to uh, continue this program through the summer. Although I do understand that this observatory may be opening to the public again come June. Maybe. Maybe. If all goes well, if things stay the way they are. Yep. Gavin Newsom just said that if all goes well, that California will be off the purple, red, orange, yellow, green tier system and everything will be open back to normal, whatever that means. We'll see. Because I'm not sure people necessarily will feel that that's a great idea. So mm. I believe we are now going to go to that distant globular cluster. Crescent Nebula or the Trifid Nebula are some ideas. Trifid is too far south. It would be looking directly over LA, so that oh, yeah, that would sucks. not look good. And what was the other one? Um, Crescent? Crescent Nebula. Crescent Nebula. I'm, I'm not, not familiar, familiar with, with the Crescent Nebula. For the 60 inch, the best objects are those that are small and high surface brightness. So planetary nebulas, planets, small galaxies, stuff like that. Uh, Open cluster in Gemini? NGC 2158. Yeah, yeah, it's too big. Oh, for our field of view. However, yeah. maybe we this Richard is, would like to go look is, at it. <laughs> these, these are limitations. There are lots of things. We look at the Andromeda Nebula, and everyone's like, doing? oh. I didn't do anything. Not the Andromeda Nebula. What am I talking about? The Andromeda Galaxy. And everyone's like, oh, because you just see a tiny portion of the nucleus of the galaxy. Um, that's just an image we're looking at now, right? Let's that's go back just, to yeah, the dome view. We brought, we brought the lights up and they're slewing to a different object, so I just freeze it. You can look at our lovely telescope again. Right, so but the next object we're going to is something that this telescope is famous for, and that is a globular cluster. The thing is, uh, you may not know this, but there's a sort of season for globular clusters. Uh, mm. in the night sky and we are kind of off season and there's only one that we have access to and it turns out it is the most distant that we probably know of so it's going to be very faint this is not something you could attempt with your backyard telescope unless you had really 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 dark skies and you know some really good uh, aperture uh, and we can do we, should we do a little demonstration of why we have a season of gobbler clusters using our Sure. Visual aid. Absolutely. Why don't you, yeah, just bring it over here. <laughs> Oops. I think it's so far away I can't find it. <laughs> I go back to the this. webcam here. All right. This is a model. <laughs> uh, it's half a model, half of our galaxy. This is uh, courtesy of Cynthia Hunt. She uh, built this out of a dog frisbee and some styrofoam. So this is our galaxy. It's sort of pancake shaped. It's got some nice spiral arms. Oh, they're all falling. Watch out, we're losing our globular clusters. <laughs> they're, they're heading to the new place of the galaxy. Oh, good gracious me. That's gravity, folks. It just doesn't stop. Okay. And we're, we're somewhere around here in the plane of the Milky Way. Here, put it back. Okay, and this uh, white, semicircle here represents what we call the bulge, which is a sort of older population of stars in the center of the galaxy. And these are the globular clusters. And they kind of orbit around the, yeah, they, around the galaxy. So there should be some down below, but we'll just ignore that for the moment. Now, you can imagine if you're sitting over here and you're looking in this direction, you're going to see all kinds of globular clusters in your sky. But if you're looking in the other direction, which is what we're doing now, That's and way too <laughs> we just lost the... <laughs> well, I think you get the point. 
if you look that way, you don't see as many globular clusters. And that's the discovery that this telescope made was which way were all the, where was the center of the galaxy where all these globular clusters are clustered around. But now we're going to try and figure out and act, see the real thing. So uh, we'll get back to that in a second. But yeah. So, uh, time so I'm just looking at the chat feed again. Bode's galaxy. Next, after this one. After this one. <laughs> You're anticipating our observing, <laughs> our target list. Is that it? Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. That's right. Okay, so this is going to look wrong, and then we will. Okay, well. We got something? Center, guys, not bad. Oh, oops. Shall I, shall I turn over to your view? Uh, in a sec. They're Maybe still I, figuring things out. I guess I needed to just have that much exposure, I guess, in order to see it. Yeah, well, I'm at 30 seconds. Uh, I think we're, we're, I think this is focused, right? No, it's focused. We need more. more. Request we just need for the more. Crescent Nebula? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, you can go, is go to the field. way and beyond what the telescope can get down to. So it's right ascension is 20 hours, and we're oh. at about 8. Mm. Okay, so here we are, and you probably don't see very much at the moment, um, and that's because I'm only down to two seconds, so I'm going to bring the exposure time up again, and as I do so, so now we're going to be at three seconds, now let's go to five seconds, I'll have to reposition my levels here. You might start to see some stars coming out to say hello. And okay, now we're going to be up to eight seconds. It's getting there, it's getting there. It's really far away. Yeah. This is, uh, this is a struggle, even for a 60-inch telescope. And I'm going to bring it up to 10, or 11, I guess. And this one we can probably, we'll probably be able to do some stacking, because there's going to be plenty of star-like mm. objects to look at. So let's see what it does with 11 seconds. Oh, and I should try binning, just to see if that actually works first. Let's see what happens. Let's try it. Stacking trial. We're going to try and stack. So as this is trying to stack, there was a question about is there any chance that you might attempt to photograph the currently visible bright comet within limits of this telescope? Uh, do we have any current? Do we have any current bright comets? I don't know of any bright comets. I know there's one that was that was making the news, but yeah, it's in the southern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere is a little too low for us to be able to. <laughs> that doesn't look like that. Declination is a little okay. too low. Let's try going to 15 seconds and see if we can get more of this. That would be fun though. Comet chasers. Yeah. It's like the eclipse chasers. You need a usually the exact opposite telescope, usually an astrograph. Yeah. 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 All right, so we have 115 stack. How's it looking in the feed, Jenny? Is it, can you actually see the stars? I can see on my um, big feed, I can see it come through. And I think I can see, because I oh, am watching the feed that is ending up on YouTube. So a lot of, huh, sometimes what we see here at the observatory is not exactly what you see back home. Um, because, YouTube compresses the signal, or I don't know what YouTube does with the signal. But yeah, I think that this particular globular cluster, some of the individual stars are coming through. Yeah, on the globe, what did you just do? Yep, that's looking good. It's still a smudge. So we started off this evening looking at Mars. 
we can definitely look at Mars. Um, the scene isn't great. Um, Venus is up in the morning sky these days, yeah? Yep. Yep, we're not going to be here at that time. Because I have to teach tomorrow morning. So I will not be up here looking at the stars and skies. But yes, we can absolutely look at Venus and Mars. Um, and there's nothing now. stopping us. Mars was pretty low, so I think right so now it's far it. too low to be able to go back uh, no, to it's actually not projecting any of them. first thing in the evening. No, but it's um, sometimes getting the... Oh, see that one didn't work. We certainly looked at Jupiter and Saturn. We had a conjunction virtual star party in December, December 21st. That was a huge hit. We had many more people attend our, our live session, our live stream than we had anticipated. All right, um, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna try going to a medium gain to try to reduce the, the noise and bump up the exposure to like 30 seconds just to see what happens. Nothing like real time observing. Let's try this. That didn't work. Yeah. Let's well, try that's, this That's piece. the way it works, right? Yeah. <laughs> Put this filter on. Maybe it'll be a little better. <laughs> All right. I think we have a lot of extra strong out there in the Let's crowd. See what we get. So they uh, totally, totally can understand what we're going through. Have you uh, told them how far this thing is? I have not. Well, you should tell them how far this thing is because that, that will put okay. it in perspective. <laughs> so this is um, NGC 2419. Is this yes. what we're looking at? Known as the Intergalactic Wanderer. It is in the constellation Lynx, which is um, out beyond the edge of the galaxy, yeah. as Chris was showing earlier. And it lies on the opposite side of the sky to the globular rich interior part of the Milky Way. Um, it is 300,000 light years from us. Now, the whole Milky Way galaxy diameter is 100,000 light years. So this is way beyond the kind of confines of the visible portion of the galaxy. But for those of you who know about dark matter, the galaxy is quite a bit bigger than what is observable. Um, so this is a globular cluster that is still bound to the Milky Way gravitationally. Um, it's dim. You can't see it without a telescope. The first person to note it was William Herschel, who did a lot of observing. He's kind of, back in the 1700s, he was kind of the king of observing. Um, you can see it, you know, it is, Pretty bright for what it is. Uh, it says on Sky Safari Pro that with a good quality telescope as small as four inches um, in diameter, you should be able to see this. Now that's assuming you have nice dark skies. So, Alaska. And that's the next dark sky. Um, 300,000, one of the most remote globules from the Milky Way or in the Milky Way. Same distance from our galaxy's center um, and nearly twice as far out as the Large Magellanic Cloud. At this great distance, it takes three billion years to make one orbit of the galaxy, one trip around the sun. The nickname Intergalactic Wanderer was bestowed upon it when it was erroneously believed to not be in orbit around the Milky Way. So there we go. Okay, we have a CMOS question. Who would like to tackle this one? Richard, Chris? Here well, we go. Ask the Any question first. Yeah, <laughs> figure it out. Any tips for setting up a color CMOS ASI, or a, yeah, ASI camera? My setting at Unity Game was giving me a lot of color noise. What is your go-to for settings? It's um, your gain. You want to go to ZWO's website, and they will tell you what the optimal gain is for your um, camera that you have. So like on the refractor, depending on the object that I want to see, it's either 0 or 100. 
on other ones, telescopes, I mean other cameras, it'll be a different setting. So you want to go check the actual manufacturer website. Hopefully that helps. And speaking of the other one, let's bring over Richard's... Uh, I don't even know if you'll be able to see it. Yeah. Let's tell, tell, uh, tell us in the comments if you can see where the Globular Cluster is. I'm not going to point it out right now. I'm not seeing it show up on the, on the YouTube feed. feed. Yeah, it might, the, the compression might be uh, too much no, for it. Or didn't show oh, up. it didn't show up. Well, that's interesting. Are we still? Uh, to bring the mouse over there and move Apparently, it that answer helped. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And for those of you who said that I was a little faint, nope. hopefully. You're frozen. Hopefully, I'm better now. Um, I was leaning away from the microphone. I keep forgetting I'm not, the microphone is not attached to me. It is a desktop version. And I happen to be leaning and facing the other way. So thank you for pointing that out. I will make every attempt to keep my, my face directed toward the... Uh, for some reason, it's not updating. Yeah, we're not updating the it looks like we haven't been. Oh, my goodness. We haven't been updating for a long time because I don't even see anything there. Um, Can we switch? Try switching, yes. Oh, it's... Shoot. It. Yeah, it's this thing. Okay, let me uh, let's let's do some real time. Uh, do properties. Okay, we're gonna go this, and then we're gonna go back to this. And no, it still looks. Okay, I may have to unplug it and plug it in again. Oh. <laughs> So our feed from the other computer where the attic camera is, is frozen. So we're doing the ever so famous unplug and plug it back in. <laughs> and hopefully that will solve the issue. Okay. Nope, still frozen. Yeah, I'm just going to... Oh, that's our mouse. There, there's a mouse on every computer screen. Sometimes I... <laughs> Oh, okay, we got a mouse again. Good. Yay. Okay, we're back. Oh, so you can't you can't see the this globular one, cluster at all. You could earlier. <laughs> you could earlier, but now could it earlier? seems to have All right, I'm gonna go back to high gain then and uh, just go for broke. Oh, right. and let's try binning, just to, just for giggles. So there's another question, yes. and it is, do you guys use DSS for stacking um, for pics in sight? Uh, so we are using, sorry, we're using the software that came, oh wait, no, uh, for the attic that's attached to the 60 inch, we're using the software that comes with the camera, which is called, um, what's it called again? Infinity, I think? Infinity. Infinity. Uh, whereas Richard is using a third-party software. Yeah. Launchy, you can describe what it is. Yeah, we're using um, SharpCap on the other one. The only reason we're not using PixInsight, because I have it on there, is it's kind of more of a post-process, and we're trying to do this live, quick and easy, as fast as we can to get it out and get it so it's visible. Yeah. Um, PixInsight is, it's really kind of cool. In fact, like I said, I got it on mine, but um, it's for post-processing. Are you seeing it now, Jenny? On the oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. good. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, now I can bring in Richard's view. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to have to zoom in. And so. it is quite small. Okay, let's yeah. go there. So that's the view. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And that's over 10 minutes of data. Right. This is 10 minutes, <laughs> 10, of, stacking. 10 minutes of stacking. Whereas if we go back to the 60 inch, uh, this is 30 seconds of stacking. Uh, not stacking. We're not even stacking. We're just taking yeah, a 30, 30 second image because it can't figure out how to stack this. 
But this is the faintest globular cluster you're likely ever to see. And this would be an extremely, extremely challenging object. I don't even know if you could do it with your eyeballs. Uh, you'd have to have a huge telescope to do that. Uh, you might be able to see it, that I guess, if you were it here. That does have a visual magnitude of plus 10. Well, that's the entire thing that's all the whole thing. together. Yeah. Yeah. Each individual star is going to be just way, way low. OK, are we, uh, are we happy going somewhere else? Okay, let's, uh, I will confer with the, the powers that be and we'll decide where we're going to go next. All right, yes. Yeah. 81? Sweet. 81. One of Hode's galaxies. So we're moving out. We're, we're sort of heading out into the deep, deep sky. Well, Hode's nebula, as it was called, is called, I suppose. Back when I suppose they thought it was nebula. Oh, hello, lights in the dome. Let's go back to our dome view. I mean, well, they're, they're side by side. Yes. So now you can see <laughs> all of us on the right hand side of the screen. We've got um, a iPad, a laptop, a laptop, two monitors here, one on the other side. And we have the roving view. So Chris, if you want to do the roving view at any point. Okay. So while they're still moving the telescope around, Chris is going to pick up uh, iPhone attached to a device that makes you not motion sick. And we are going to see how this goes. I can hear you. Oh, Barbara can hear me. Yeah, Barbara, you can you probably hear me through Zoom, whereas the folks on YouTube are not hearing it. All right, so hopefully we have audio now. Hopefully we have audio now. Let's know if the audio is different. Can you tell we're not professionals? <laughs> they don't teach us this in graduate school. Okay, I'll just continue, hopefully that, that yeah, okay, good. So at the bottom here, we've got the 60-inch mirror. So it's 60 inches from side to side. And at the top, we have the secondary mirror. So light comes from outer space through the shutter down the tube. It then reflects off the mirror, goes back up the tube, reflects off that secondary, which you can kind of see up there comes back down again, and right in there, there's a third mirror, <clears throat> which then sends the light out the side here. And normally, instead of a camera like this, we would have an eyepiece. In fact, we have an eyepiece over there. Derek, could you grab the eyepiece, which is just under the lamp? It's got the two handles. Yeah, bring it on over so folks can see this is the eyepiece that we would sometimes put in a telescope. And as you can see, it's pretty big, a lot bigger than your average uh, amateur uh, eyepiece. And these are a lot, a lot of these are custom made for the 60 inch. And that would slide right into here. And then we have our focusing 
knob right there, which sends this in and out. I will not demonstrate that because that would put our camera out of focus, obviously. And down here, we've got our controls. That lets us change where the telescope's pointed while we're looking through the eyepiece. And here's a little bit of fun for the amateur astronomers who may use these. This is our Telrad. And so when our encoders are confused, then we have to re revert to using this device, which is a heads-up display of sorts that puts an eye, uh, a bullseye on the sky, and then we can center on a star with known coordinates and then reset our encoders and get back to where we should be looking. Now, let's have a look at the way the telescope's pointed now. So as you can see, it's almost lined up with the North Pole. And that's because we're looking at M81 or M82. They're sort of same, in the same part of the sky. And they're in the constellation of Ursa Major, which is very close to the North Celestial Pole. So this telescope is looking almost due north right now. And in fact, if we were using an eyepiece, uh, it would be the most comfortable. Well, actually, actually for, for kids, it'd be pretty good because it'd be right the right height. All right, so I think we're probably going to try and find out what's in the in the view, see how it's looking. So I'm going to sign off on this, and you can go back to the other audio. Out we're do, uh, there we go. Coming back to the webcam. Got the mic unmuted. Lights are down because we're going to M82. We're there. Oh, we're, we're there. Well, Maybe. They're still figuring point. things out. Let's bring it down to <laughs> so our Alaskan friend has a new target to look at, um, and that would be the Intergalactic Wanderer. Mm. Oh. Good. So you can tell learn something goes. new. Yeah, please tell us how it goes. Come back in a couple weeks. Our next observing um, observing session, virtual star party. Our next party up here at Mount Wilson is two weeks tonight. So we do this on a Tuesday night, which is basically the schedule that we could all accommodate. And it is from 8 to 10 p.m. Pacific time. So those of you um, visiting from Michigan, they may have already signed off because it's getting a little later in Michigan. Is Michigan East Coast or it's Central? central yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Probably Central. So we're just centering so, up now. Centering on M82, M82 which I'm going to bring my iPad over here to get the data on so that my mouth still faces my gigantoid um, microphone here. And M82 is um, Bode's Nebula. It is also known as NGC 3034 or Messier 82. Well, that's the M82, Bode's Nebula. It is a peculiar galaxy in Ursa Major. Ursa Major, for those of you who may not know, is full of galaxies. So it's, I don't know, a lucky patch of sky to observe within. It was discovered along with its partner, M81, uh, by Johann Bode, and both galaxies are sometimes known as Bode's Nebulae. Um, back in the day, I'm not sure when, when Johann Bode lived, but they, in the 1700s, 1774 was when they were discovered. Um, this was before galaxies were known as separate entities from the Milky Way. Many of the spiral structured galaxies were known back then as spiral nebulae, and certainly the great spiral nebulae of Andromeda, or nebula of Andromeda, um, was renamed the Andromeda Galaxy in the late 1920s. Are we ready? We're ready. So exciting. Let's put that there. 
and go and have a look wow. at this galaxy. Woo! All right, so this is five seconds. Uh, oh, so first of all, I'm going to bring the cooler up because it's not quite reaching this one. All right, so we're going to bring the exposure up bit by bit. Eastern Daylight, Michigan. East, <laughs> oh, they're on Eastern. Oh, okay. Yep. That means they're dedicated. <laughs> Wow, in Alaska it's 8.30, so they're an hour um, west of us, and it doesn't get to astronomical darkness until 11 p.m. You're far north. How's it looking in the feed, by the way? Um, looks pretty good in the feed, actually. Okay, good, I'm gonna keep oh, going. Oh, we have someone from Ontario, Brantford. Oh, so we're gonna go for 10 seconds next. Let's see how it gets. Thank you. To the Brantford. I'm from Toronto. Maybe some of the American listeners have heard my accent. Um, I know where Brantford is. This is the best thing we've All right, there it is. So, look at 81. Yeah. That is beautiful. Now, with the 60-inch telescope here at Mount Wilson, because it has such a narrow field of view, you cannot get both M81 and M82 into the field of view. This, what we're looking at, is M82. Messier 82, uh, what's the NGC number? 3034. And, and so this is an edge-on galaxy? Yep. And the dark parts that you're seeing is very much like the dark parts of our own Milky Way. If you ever go out to a dark site and look at the Milky Way, you may see that there appear to be gaps in the brightness of the Milky Way. And that is caused by what we call interstellar dust, which is just a fanciful name for large grains of hydrocarbons and other things that absorb visible light. And so it's not that you're not seeing any stars there, it's just that the, uh, the light from those stars is being absorbed by the dust. The other interesting thing about this particular galaxy, M82, is that it's called a starburst galaxy. And that just means that it is producing stars at a much higher rate than our own Milky Way galaxy. And if I had thought about it, I would have looked up the star formation rate ahead of time to let you know how many stars are being formed at a time. Maybe I'll look that up while you guys gander at this. All right, let me look. Type 1A supernova that oh, yes. was discovered in M82 back in 2014. 2014J. 2014J. So Chris's area of expertise is Type 1A supernovae. So he knows them all by name. And there was one that you was the cow. <laughs> oh yeah, 2017 COW. So. The type 1A supernova are very good for cosmological distance um, scale uh, work. And there are so many that are being discovered now. It used to be the year that the supernova was discovered and then a letter. But then they ran out of letters when you get to the end of the alphabet. So then they had to go to two letters and then they had to go to three and there was 2017 COW. So now they're called, and it was a particularly interesting type 1A supernova. So now they're all saying, because I, I just hear him and his colleagues, is it cow like? Yeah. <laughs> Are we going to find a cow? <laughs> Are we going to find a cow? Which is wonderful to hear, especially if you don't know what they're talking about. You have all these astronomers talking about cows. I'm like, Yep. And the, uh, the, the theorists who are modeling these things usually do have to assume a spherical cow. Because <laughs> it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, so I looked it up, and M82, the one we're looking at right now, has a star formation rate of about 10 solar masses a year. So that means 
10 stars like our sun produced or formed out of the gas every year. Every year? In comparison, the Milky Way is about one solar mass a year, so one new star per, per year. But this is and 10 it times more. millions of years for stars to form, so. It's, it's, really, wow. it's really cooking. It's, yeah. Okay, so uh, now let's have a look at what, this, what you see through the refractor. Again, because we have a wider field of view, you can get both at the same time. So we're looking over at this one here, but its neighbor, M81, is over here. And I think you can probably tell that there is some spiral structure in this one. So whereas this one's edge on, and if it has spirals, we can't see them because we're looking at the edge of the galaxy. Over here, we're looking at it on, a, on an angle. And so we're seeing these beautiful spiral patterns uh, from the galaxy. Now, one of the reasons, probably the primary reason that this galaxy here is forming so many stars so rapidly is because this galaxy over here is harassing it. <laughs> there, is a, <laughs> there is something called galaxy harassment. Uh, or basically the, the gravitational effects of this galaxy on the other one, they probably had a recent flyby, they close encounter, and that sort of knocks around the gas inside these galaxies. And when you do that, you sort of cause conditions which allow these gas clouds to collapse and form those stars. And that's uh, a way that you can get these galaxies to turn on their star formation a little bit more than they would have normally. So there was a question. Um, I read somewhere there were more supernova, supernovae in M82 per mass of the galaxy, I guess, than in any other galaxies. Would there be any theories on that? Uh, so it's probably more um, what we call core collapse. Super so the supernova that went off 2014J was a type 1A supernova. And that is the result of a white dwarf star, which actually comes from a relatively small, smaller star, lower mass star, just like our sun. Um, the ones that are probably going off in M82 are what are called the core collapse supernova, type twos, and they result from massive stars. And so this galaxy is producing stars at a higher rate, which means it's going to be producing massive stars. Those massive stars burn through their fuel a lot faster, and so they die in a shorter time scale. And so we're probably seeing lots of supernovae going off because that's the result of this increased star formation that we're seeing in this galaxy currently. But yeah, it's been, it's been a, uh, giving us quite a few supernovas. The Milky Way, the last supernova that we had in the Milky Way is over 400 years ago. So we're waiting for the next one be nice. We, we kind of thought maybe Betelgeuse was about to you know, go, but it didn't. <laughs> it says, I hope in my lifetime to be able to see Betelgeuse go supernova. Oh, like, we're... It keeps correcting to, and again, Betelgeuse like the movie as opposed to... Yeah. Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse. Or... You and everybody here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when it was dimming down last year, everyone was like, is it, is it, is it, what's happening? But, <laughs> Uh, I, I would. It's far enough away that we All of us are like, come on already. We're waiting. <laughs> Get on with it. It would be so cool in our galaxy, which hasn't been since Kepler's supernova. Kepler's last, so yep. Kepler's was the last 1604. one. 1604. So, yeah. we're long two, overdue. They got Tycho's and Kepler's. All right, so this is M82. Um, what getting towards the end. have yeah. we yeah. got? We've got about 15 So, it's either left. that or we try the double laser. Okay. So I think Jenny needs to move a little closer to the mic. This is There's yeah. a discussion going on what we are going to try to target next. Oh, something's too low. Is it? It's at all. Even if it's technically above the horizon, we can't get there with that far. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do an empty one. 
to finish off with that. So we're going to zoom in to M81 with the 60 inch. Oh, why don't we just leave the... We just leave the... the other one of Bode's nebulae slash galaxies. And just um, while they're figuring out how to move over there, I'm going to pop back over to Stellarium awesome. to give you guys That's a bit really of a view awesome. to help you figure out where these galaxies are. So, uh, hang on. I need to do that in the stream. So here we have Stellarium again. Um, so Stellarium.org, you can go to it. It is free no, it's, yeah, it's to free download. Too. It's open source um, software. You can get it for your um, desktop. You can get a browser version, but it's not quite as good. And I believe you can get a mobile version for your device, but that you have to pay for. The desktop downloadable is, or laptop obviously, is free. Oh. Turn and th th this is M82, but as I zoom in, you'll be able to see um, a little more clearly. And for those who may know the Big Dipper, um, which is part of the constellation of Ursa Major, here are the seven stars of the Big Dipper. And yes, it is a bear, kind of an upside down bear that you can see right there. So just kind of over the bear's shoulder, um, we can see this region, and if I, whoops, keep you zooming in. Cats, so it's way too far. Then you can see M82, which is what we're zooming in on here, and then M81, which is close by and being the harasser, I believe, mm. is the term. So this is kind of, these images undoubtedly are Hubble Space Telescope images, and often what you see online is somewhat deceptive because um, what institutions will do is they will take a visible light photograph as well as an ultraviolet light photograph that has been false colored because obviously our eyes can't see ultraviolet, but you can take particular wavelengths and then kind of color them so that we can see them and infrared and they will take all of these different wavelength ranges and stack them and make them beautifully colorful and whatnot really kind of bump up the color and enhance it and so what you're seeing is actual observation but it is absolutely not what you're going to see naked eye so i'm not going to zoom in anymore i'm just going to keep zooming out because i just kind of wanted to show you the um, location of this object with respect to the Big oh, Dipper okay. here. And then I am going to head back over to the... Can I head over to you to see what you're looking yeah, at? We're just, we're just going oh, to they're center. just organizing things. The anticipation. You can let it build. Uh, can we do Iota Cancri? That's one of the double stars, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, if we have time? Yeah, Stellarium is fun. I would say it's my go-to planetarium, but I'm actually the planetarium director at a really yeah, awesome planetarium nice. we have at Glendale campus. It's a 48-seat, um, 30-foot like diameter it. dome that, that runs the SkyScan. Uh, dark matter software, and we have a 4K, 4K by 4K to um, Sony projector system, which I haven't turned on in a year, which rather breaks my heart. Um, but yes, as a backup, Stellarium is a fantastic <laughs> planetarium, uh, personal planetarium, if you would. So can we go to this one yet? Yeah. Uh oh, pervert. No, no, they're. Oh, just you're just centering. Ah. <laughs> oh, they're still centering the oh, <laughs> the galaxy. Um, so the image is kind of streaked because oh, yeah, doesn't look doesn't look too. Excuse me. Sneeze out of nowhere. Uh, okay, we'll increase the exposure. 
one frame ignored. I must have didn't like that. I don't think we need to stack. It's there. Is M81 too big, actually, for a field of view? It is pretty big. Yeah. Um, so we're just so we're getting see... definitely the central regions. Yeah. Shall I go see. over to it? You may go over to it, yes. There we go. That's the central region of M81. Chris is just going to fuss with it and make it a little more beautiful. And it's pretty red. Hmm. Are we excited about the James Webb t Space Telescope? Yes, we got time on the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm. We're very excited. We're going to be... Uh... If it goes, I keep thinking, I, th I believe when I, you know, it was supposed to launch initially in... 2008. Yeah, I was going to say 2010 and then 2012 and then, well, the recession didn't do good things for the space program, but are we excited? Ecstatic. Yep. So it's... It, a nerve-wracking launch, as always. So it launches September this year? I think so, yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's the latest uh, mm. launch date. Well, fingers crossed they don't push that de back at all. So here we're probably seeing the very core. Uh, this is probably an older population of stars. So when we're looking at M82, we're seeing like this really massive star-forming galaxy. And probably looking into the into where these stars are forming. These are older stars. Uh, this is the bulge of the galaxy, so this is kind of the older part. Uh, and because these are older stars, they're going to be lower mass stars because mm -hmm. lower mass stars last longer. They burn through their fuel at a much lower rate. Uh, but because they're smaller, that also means they don't burn as hot, and that means they're going to be redder. So the bluer a star is, the hotter it is, and usually the more massive it is because it needs all that extra gravity to burn at that high rate. But when you have these red, old stars, this is the kind of galaxy you get, the sort of reddish, often referred to as red and dead, but this is a, this is a spiral <laughs> galaxy, so the, the spiral arms are probably still performing the stars out there. And somewhere in there, there's a black hole, but we're not going to see it. It's surrounded by bright stars, yep. which is why you can't see it. And inevitably, in the planetarium, can, can you point out a black hole? And mm -hmm. my usual response is, well, black doesn't show up well on a black night sky. And there's a lot of knowing nods. I can't believe that answer usually works. But um, yes, we can't see the black hole, even though we can detect it. It ain't stacking that one for some reason. Can we see the exterior of your uh, shed? Just to show everyone what the what we're fighting. Oh, the light pollution. Mm. Yeah, I just figured why not. So Richard um, has his telescopes in a small roll-off shed here on Mount Wilson and he's got an exterior camera that we are now trying to get the view from to see the entire <laughs> setup. City glow everywhere. Kind of like a, you know, bird's eye view if you would. <laughs> and Perfect. Do you want to drag it over? Yeah, just drag it over. <laughs> this is the glow of Greater Los Angeles. <laughs> Oh, we're getting some uh, green, layer. So, green layer coming in. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, the best nights are when we have the marine layer, which is an inversion layer, and you get clouds that are very low down, so it kind of caps the light pollution. And up on Mount Wilson, because we're at, what, 5,300 feet? 5,700, yeah. 5,700 feet. We're above that cloud layer. And it's a beautiful dark sky when that comes in. But, um, yeah, you can see why the telescopes um well you can see what the telescopes are are fighting that's actually east of los angeles so um orange county that's looking east and uh, well southeast orange county is a little bit more to the right and la we can we can actually watch the planes land from into lax from up here <laughs> oh <laughs> it's always lovely yep great but if you look on the left hand side that is 
the pillar um, and then the the telescope, the rig up top. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think you can see the shed roof at this point. It kind of no, it's in the comes in from the lower left. And so it completely slides off the dome. There's a computer there. And the last time we were up here two weeks ago, it was really windy. I mean, it was actually quite a windstorm down in LA. There were power outages and things of that nature. But you can see the monitor, which is the big glowing rectangle there on the left. That fell out, that got blown out of the dome and it was dangling by its cord. Yeah, the, it, it survived. I checked, uh, it was over 30 miles an hour gust hit it and <laughs> took it out. Yeah. But uh, that's when, I guess you need the old CRTs, they wouldn't go anywhere. We won't broadcast passwords. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is M81. Um, we just have a few minutes left. I don't think we have time to move the dome o over to Iota Cancri, um, but that is one of our go-to. Oh, he's got an inside view. So those are the telescopes right there. A TSU shed, yeah, a couple of scopes. This, this and is your new mount right here. Yep, we'll get a future telescope on that one, and we'll try using it as well. Right. We need more screens in here. <laughs> so, <laughs> how many monitors can you have lined up on the, on? We need more desks oh, to put the monitors on. Do you want to do you want to use this one as well? You oh, we can one? just do a quick look at it. Sure, bring it on over. We just so we can't reach this object with uh, the sixty inch because there's a limit on how far east and west we can go. Uh, but Richard doesn't have that limitation with his. Uh, refractor and so what we're looking at now is the cat's eye nebula no actually this is no. the ghost of jupiter oh i'm sorry <laughs> ghost of jupiter oh, it looks like the cat's eye. i was gonna say <laughs> my telescope would have had to turn upside down too to get to that okay so this is yeah. something we were not going to be able to quite reach with the 60 inch but it's another planetary nebula also has multiple ring structures next time next time we do this and we'll we'll it'll be a better because as we go later into the season, the objects that are further east move towards uh, better positions for us to catch them. Uh, so we'll be able to see more different objects as we go along. Yeah. So I think we're going to close out the evening with um, our final view of M81. Yeah. This is 81, right? We did 82 yes. first. Our final view of M81, it Wait. is 9.58. Do you guys want to put the lights on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. And we can have a final view of my team here, our team, <laughs> Mount Wilson team in conjunction with the Carnegie mm. Observatories and the um, Glendale Community College. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. We will be back in two weeks. So we have... Oh, hang on, the, this way. Um, whoa. Oh, that is just so weird. Yes, <laughs> my, which my arm right is your left was, and your left. So Daryl right and Tom yes. and then Richard behind me over here. And then we also have lurking off to the side, <laughs> Derek and Chris. So from the six of us here, way up top, Mount Wilson, thank you very much for joining us this thank evening. You. Um, there is, uh, well, you can always comment in the YouTube um, below and then I will try and get back to you have any, if you have any questions or if you have more comments. If there's anyone that you think would like to join us, please let them know. This live stream is open to everyone who would love to see the celestial objects that we can showcase with the 60 inch telescope. But at this point, I will say good night to you all. And this is why I need those cameras.